Okay, welcome back. It's time to resume the morning uh, session. Uh, next piece, uh, speaker is Michael Herbst from um, uh, Aachen. And, uh, well, let's see, the, they're called the poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and he's going to talk about this uh, DFT theory framework, uh, DFTK. So please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh... I am Michael Herbst, as, as Francesco said. So yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to the organizers to, for the nice invitation. So I'm gonna switch gears a tiny little bit. So my talk is not so much about machine learning. It's more about basically like, I would say, uh, providing tools and providing uh, algorithmic, uh, like, yeah, basically algorithmic design for machine learning and sort of the one, the one step ahead, the one step before you start your machine learning model. So what I'm going to talk about is basically the density functional toolkit, um, a project that has been going on now for like three years with Antoine Levit and Eric Cantes. It started at my postdoc at uh, CEMIX, they call Pont, and we're now continuing it. And like the most recent thing we started is making it differentiable, algorithmically differentiable. So I talk about that and I talk about basically some, some background of AD and, and sort of like some challenges in this context. So basically just let me emphasize the idea here is that taking like uh, taking like a physical expression for the stress here, what we want to do and what we have in this case already achieved is that you basically just write some code which is more or less a one-to-one -one copy. And it basically gives you as a practitioner who is interested in the property or in a derivative a way to compute that. And most actually most of the like under the hood work that, that I'm going to present today has been done by Niklas Schmitz, a bachelor student from TU Berlin, who has been doing a Google Summer of Code project with us. And basically all I'm going to talk about today is the result of this Google Summer of Code. Um, all right, so let's get started. Now, um, I think at this meeting, I don't really have to motivate very much the, the, um, the overall ideas and the overall, um, yeah, why we would need such derivatives and so on, and why we would need machine learning based uh, first principle models. So um, just very briefly, I think DFT is a great theory for like predictions for, for computing molecular or solid state properties because of its nice favorable cost accuracy ratio. We have some very well known limitations. So basically, on the other hand of the scale, we have machine learning, which has really nice predictive powers in some uh, in some cases. So sort of the the question is some of the limitations here that well, we need a lot of data and transferability is not so clear. Can we sort of like combine the best of both worlds and patch up DFT with some additional physics? I mean, we've heard talks about this and that's also sort of the starting point, the motivation for the developments I'm going to present to do today. So um, just like we heard also in Kieran's talk, talk yesterday, a bit of the history of all of this. I'm sort of just want to give you a very brief overview of some of the steps I have collected here. So people basically since 2012, something like that along those lines a bit earlier, there's been some work going on, on also like differentiable codes that are able to compute the derivatives using algorithmic differentiation. And also lately um, a larger amount and a larger density of, of uh, publications with like neural network based um, exchange correlation functionals. And what I wanted to point out is that the, the frameworks that have been used to basically uh, make the differentiability um, and make the neural network backend um, have been different ones. And uh, basically most of the works have been restricted to Gaussian basis sets as far as I know and like molecular settings. And codes really have been written from sketch and have been written like specifically to this AD framework. So in my opinion, that's a bit of a problem because I mean, we don't actually know yet fully what we want. So one of the things that we wanted to basically keep in mind for our work and for our design is not to be too specific and sort of have the ability to maybe switch these things later, but I'll talk about that in a second, some more. All right, so basic idea, neural enhanced DFT is what I've called it here just as a bit of a buzzword. I mean, we have, if we look at the standard variational problem of DFT, we're minimizing some energy functional given some parameters like atomic coordinates, some external field or so. And we want, let's say the density, density matrix. That's the thing we minimize over. And then if we basically enhance this by some neural network model, we just get an extra term. That's roughly the setting here. And then 
the training parameters of the neural network model. That's what we want to optimize, uh, given some data that we have recorded before. And then sort of that naturally leads to the question, what is optimal, right? How do we do the optimization? So then how do we do this? Well, <clears throat> I mean, of course, the standard thing, we set up some loss function. So, okay, we have our DFT problem, given some, some data here, some, some atomic structure, for example, uh, that's the parameters of the neural, model, neural net model we want to optimize over and we have some reference. So we just optimize until the loss is zero. Okay, now what's the problems here? Um, first of all, if we do the loss, we get unusual derivatives, I'll, like more details in the next slides. We, we will actually need higher order derivatives and actually the dimensionality of this, of this is actually quite large. So efficiency is also key point to keep in mind. Now let's look at these things in a bit more detail. First of all, the unusual derivatives aspect. So if I take the derivative of this guy with respect to, to this uh, um, neural net parameters, what will happen is that I will need to compute partial derivatives of the density matrix with respect to these parameters, which is not so easy. I'll show some details in one of the later slides. So the point here is that what we actually need is this derivative of the density matrix with respect to the neural network parameters and the exchange correlation parameters in that sense. And that's not really a common derivative. So that's what I mean by unusual derivatives. So, because the thing is that the associated response problem we need to solve to get these derivatives depends both on the XC and the neural network model. And given that we're not so sure yet what sort of models to use here, we get some sort of an exp a combinatorial explosion if you want to have the flexibility to explore these aspects in the future. So in my opinion, manually getting these derivatives is not really feasible, right? So it's unusual derivatives, usually not available. Manual is hard. Now, physical losses, higher order derivatives. The point is, in this loss function I showed here, I showed the energy, but we've, we've heard the discussions in the, in, the past, uh, in the past talks. Energy is actually not so interesting from a physical point of view. It's more the changes, meaning properties and responses. And what are these? Well, we've also seen this before, forces, response to atomic positions, dipole moment, and so on. That's actually also derivatives of the energy. So if we build this into the loss, we essentially automatically need higher order derivatives. So not just first derivatives of the energy. So this makes things a little, little bit more complicated. Again, combinatorial explosions, something, and it makes it harder to just have all these unusual higher order derivatives available. Next problem, dimensionality. We've seen this also in the previous talks. Dimensionality of the number of parameters beyond 10,000 is not that unusual. So simple things like basically brute force finite differences does scale as the order of n times the cost of the primal, meaning cost of evaluating the loss function, i.e. the energy in here. So basically it's linearly the cost of the SCF. So 10,000 times an SCF to get one derivative is not so efficient. So it's probably not worth going that road. So we have to be a bit more clever. And that's really the point here. So because of all of these aspects I've been briefly discussing now, an efficient automated way to get derivatives is really crucial to be able, in my, uh, to, be able to make progress, in my opinion, in this direction of, of designing neural network-based uh, functionals. All right. So brief overview of AD. Um, well, AD is really such a computational tool. That's how I view it to compute arbitrary derivatives. So basically, if you have a differentiable code, meaning a code where you can apply AD, you can basically compute any derivative of like output quantities, like band gap forces, density, whatever, versus any input quantity. So really like pseudos, XC parameters, positions, temperature, I don't know, whatever is part of your simulation protocol, you could theoretically um, computer derivative. Now, the thing is that adjoint based methods, so I will talk about the details in a second, they actually cost asymptotically the same as evaluating a function. So this really fits exactly this problem of efficient automated um, computation of derivatives. So it's really something one would highly need. And I should really mention at this point, it's not just data enhanced DFT models. I really think there's further benefits like UQ and error estimates and so on and so forth. So this is really a computational tool that, that in my opinion is, is crucial and very helpful in, in condensed matter and, and molecular science research in general. And this in fact has been our motivation to integrate automatic differentiation in the density functional toolkit. 
Now, what is the density functional toolkit? Just like a, a few slides of advertisement, if I may. So basically our code has been designed with the idea in mind to use it from different communities. So unlike, I would say the more traditional approach that every community has designed their own code, we really want to be able to connect people and make it possible to, to work on one joint theory, in this case, DFT, plane wave DFT together. And for this, we have decided to use the Julia a programming language and we are sort of like fully composably integrated with the ecosystem so things that we can already do after like two and a half years of development is that we have support for arbitrary precision ad that's what i'm talking about today numerical errors can be predicted to some extent i'll show some slides in a second and then the point here is that these ad capabilities is sort of a side effect of our design it's not that we actually wrote the code for AD, it's sort of, we are just using the fact how our code is designed to make AD possible. And as I said, we really want to connect mathematical development and applications. We can do 1D models, analytic potentials, but also beyond 800 electrons. So it's really bridging this gap between fundamental mathematical theory and applications. And yeah, it's just Julia. So not Python, C, Fortran combined, just one language. If you learn that language, you can use our code. And it's only like six, six, uh, 7,000 lines now. So it's a small entrance barrier. And just two, two or three things that we did, which go beyond auto algorithmic differentiation. So we have an, a black box algorithm for damping, meaning you don't actually have to choose your damping in DFTK. You basically just apply this algorithm and it sort of figures out the damping um, as it goes along. So if you want more details, there's a publication which has been is an archive. Uh, can have a look at that or ask. I'm very happy to answer questions on this. Another thing we did is like having a look at a, this long-standing problem of uh, inhomogeneous systems, so like metals and insulators in one cell. We found the mixing algorithm, which again is black box and just a parametric, in a parameter-free way adapts to this. So, and the final thing I want to briefly highlight is that we can, for example, compute band structures with arrow bars, where these arrow bars are fully guaranteed arrow bounds. Uh, within, I should say, this is not full DFT, within this reduced Concharm model, because full DFT is not yet fully available. I mean, actually, this is not true. Just recently, there came a paper out where some, like the basis set error, can also be addressed in full DFT. But the point is that these sort of developments is what we're targeting. And for this, AD is just one extra tool which helps us. And that's what, what, that's what was our motivation here. All right, so let's briefly look at AD and the basics of AD. Now, how does algorithmic differentiation work? Well, let's look at this very simple function here. We just sum two values and then double it. Our goal is to compute the derivative of this function, not manually, but basically using an algorithmic procedure. Now, basically the derivative at some point, X tilde is characterized by a Jacobian matrix. Okay. so. The simple thing was finite differences, already talked about that. We get one column at a time. We don't want to do that. O to, o to the n times the primal cost, times the cost of evaluating f. Now, what can we do to make this better? Well, the thing is that the key idea of AD here is that things like double and sum, like summing and doubling, are really standard functions. So why don't we just use the fact that these standard functions are super simple to differentiate and where we already know the Jacobians to combine it. That's exactly the idea. So, I mean, it's not, I don't know, it's not really like world changing news. You can basically just take the chain rule. You can apply it to the function and out of it comes the Jacobian of the sum and the Jacobian of the double function. So in this sense, you can just combine the Jacobian, i.e. the derivative of the full function by multiplying these two Jacobians together. The point to note is that in actually evaluating this Jacobian here, we need the function result of the green step. So we're sort of doing it, we're sort of going from the right to the left. And this is exactly forward mode algorithmic differentiation. So basically to do that is we start at the input values and basically a, a column vector. Then in the first step, we basically do the sum. So we compute the sum, the actual primal pass, the actual primal function value. We have now available the Jacobian of the sum. That was our assumption that it's simple enough. So we basically apply it to the unit vector 
And then we just keep going for the second step. We go for the double and do exactly the same thing. And in the end, once we're done with our pass, we get the result of the function in, double, in, in, in Y2. And we get one column again of the Jacobian in Y.2, essentially. OK. So the implementation is super simple because, as you see, a number is sort of just changed to a number and its derivative. And this pack is called dual numbers. So basically, if you have a, a, a code which is uh, templated in that sense in the, in the floating point type, which we do in the FTK, this is basically for free. You just implement it and that's, uh, you change from numbers to dual numbers and you're done. Yeah, it's just y1. The P is just y1. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Oh, you're right. Yes, thanks for, thanks for pointing this out. Ah, I shouldn't have changed the slides too much. Yes, this is a Y1. Thanks very much. Sorry about that confusion. Okay, so the point is we just do this change, but there's a bit more tricks you can play to make it a bit faster. So in fact, it's typically faster than finite differences, but still it's order N times the primal cost. Simple to implement, but we haven't gained that much. So now can we do better? Well, it turns out that there's a theorem which actually says for scalar functions, the derivative is asymptotically not more expensive than evaluating the function. So a gradient of a scalar function costs asymptotically the same as the function. So finite diff and forward diff violate this. So can we be more clever? Well, it turns out that if you think about a function like this, you can always write it like a product, basically like a, if you want, like a B transpose vector times, a, times some matrix, which is usually sparse times some vector. So if you, if, you, if you take that and we just sort of put the A, the function, like the matrix that does the, 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 the application of the function to the left, then it's super easy to differentiate. We can just get the gradient like this. And this actually costs the same as F. So like doing this transpose here is really sort of for the rescue. And more generally, you can sort of generalize this by noticing that the function is like, you know, it's Taylor expansion of the Jacobian plus some higher order terms. So in that sense, if we just do the adjoint of the Jacobian, we actually get exactly this property, okay? So however, the order is reversed here. And that's exactly the idea of reverse mode or adjoint mode algorithmic differentiation. So we first have a forward pass where we compute all the function values because we actually need them later for computing the Jacobians. So the forward pass just goes from top to bottom. And then the reverse for pass goes from uh, bottom to top. And then again, we are accumulating, in this case, it's called Y bar. In this, in this guise, we are accumulating then uh, our contribution of the Jacobian. And the point now is that we get one row at a time, meaning that actually for computing the gradient of a scalar function, there's only one reverse pass needed. So it's actually exactly this O1 cost times the primal. And there's many names, backpropagation, adjoint mode, adjoint trick, and so on and so forth. Just to sort of tell you that all these things is exactly this procedure. Now, difficulties. Reverse control flow is actually not that easy to implement in a code, uh, especially if you think about stuff like branching and so on. So it sometimes really hurts your head. And there's an aspect with storage and memory costs that is sometimes a bit tricky, especially when you have mutation. Just, just want to mention this. The problem is whenever you mutate something and the reverse path, you sort of need to unmutate it. So it's not always easy to handle that properly. So in fact, actually also for iterative algorithms like an SCF, you have to be a little bit more clever, right? Because you have an, a loop and you have to do something with this loop. So I'll, I'll talk about this next. Uh, how much time do I have left? Just that I don't overshoot. Good, very good. And more or less exactly where I wanted to be at this time. Okay, so SCFs. Um, yeah, one way to think about an SCF is that it's essentially a fixed point function in a fixed point problem in the density matrix, right? So we have some Fermi Dirac function, which basically computes us the density matrix. And we essentially have a Hamiltonian, which depends on our external parameters, for example, the neural net and, and like the field or, or the atomic positions and so on. And basically by applying the Fermi Dirac function to the Hamiltonian, it's nothing else than saying in the sense of, yeah, you're just diagonalizing it and applying it to the eigenvalues. So it's just a shorthand to write that. And basically if what comes out of this is the density matrix, then we have self-consistency. Okay, <clears throat> now for quantities of interest, 
what you need to do is you need to take usually you apply some function to the density matrix and you take some derivative, for example, with like an external field or so. So for the forces, the function would just be the energy itself and the derivative would be the atomic displacements. Or for polarizability, the function would be the dipole moment, which you get from the density matrix. And then what you take the derivative is the electric field. So that's sort of like just a general framework for computing properties in DFT. Okay, so Heilman Feynman is the simplest way to do this, obviously. So that's sort of a special case where we look at a property that is again the, the equation I had before. If you look at a property, which is an energy property, because in this case, we can use that actually our P at which we are usually computing the properties is the minimum of the energy functional. That's exactly what the self-consistent field gives us. So therefore this partial derivative of the energy with respect to P is zero. So Hellman Feynman makes things a lot simpler, right? Essentially, we just, need to look at the partial derivative of the energy with respect to the external parameters. So first, energy derivatives are easy. Now, what if we want to go beyond that? Then we need to do response. Then it becomes a little bit more tricky. So I'm not gonna go through all this in details. The point is essentially that we need to take the derivative with respect to the eternal external parameter of the self-consistent equation, which we know is zero, so that derivative is zero we basically do some standard rearrangements. For example, we introduce something which is in this case, slight generalization of the, of the susceptibility and, and the normal exchange kernel. Um, and basically, if we do all the rearrangements and go through it properly, in the end, what we get is we get a linear response problem, essentially a linear equation that we have to solve. So the derivative of the density with respect to the external parameters at our, um, self-consistent density, <clears throat> I was saying density, but I mean density matrix. So the derivative of density matrix at the self-consistent density matrix is basically just inverting this, the, like the generalized exchange correlation kernel plus the omega matrix, which is the inverse of this generalized, uh, of this generalized um, yeah, susceptibility operator. And at the right-hand side, we basically have the change in the potential usually, right? So this is usually what happens. And people, again, this has many names, Sternheimer equation. So this is essentially the um, this is essentially the Dyson equation, which is written here. So yeah, many names, but essentially whenever you have to do response, this is what you have to solve. Now, people in the AD community call exactly this implicit differentiation. So essentially, this is a trick to differentiate through um, an SCF because it's like a linearization of one SCF step. So just again to make this a bit more concrete, one example. If I want co to compute polarizabilities, I have, for example, a homogeneous electric field. I have maybe a cubic cell to make things simple. So my Hamiltonian is just a standard DFT Hamiltonian plus some, plus some field dependent um, shift in the energy. Uh, my perturbation is essentially, yeah, is essentially this, uh, this field here, right? Because I, if I take the derivative of that expression with, with, with respect to epsilon, this is what comes out. The dipole moment is uh, depending on the density, which is the diagonal of the density matrix. And the polarizability is just the derivative of the dipole moment with respect to the field. So basically we get it like this. Okay, so we solve our SCF. That's usually the first step. Then we solve our Sternheimer problem, the implicit differentiation, and we compute the polarizability. Okay, this was probably a bit boring for you or maybe for some of you. But that's sort of the point here, because you have to do this every time you want to compute a derivative, which involves the derivative of the density matrix, like the derivative with respect to the neural network parameters that I was showing right at the beginning. So the point of like computing this with algorithmic differentiation is that SCF is a frequent primitive for electronic structure theory. So if we code up the SCF and sort of the derivative of the SCF, namely the Sternheimer once, one single time in this general framework, then the AD library can just invoke this procedure as needed. So when a user asks for gradients, then this appropriate response problem can just be automatically solved. And now if you combine this with the ideas of adjoint mode of algorithmic differentiation, essentially what this means is that because these, this omega plus k thing is additionally self-adjoint, self you only need one solver for both forwards and backward mode algorithmic differentiation. But you get one benefit on top because in fact, there's only one Sternheimer solve that you need per output parameter. 
Okay, because reverse depends on the complexity of the output parameters and not input. Meaning if I have an energy or a scalar quantity and I wanted the sensitivity with respect to my parameters in my model, I need one single Sternheimer solve and then I'm done. And that's actually quite nice because in that sense, I can basically, yeah, I can get derivatives with respect to a large number of parameters and for example, neural network based approaches. And I should say there are some additional goodies like um, higher derivatives are easily implemented. You can have specification techniques and so on. I'm not going into the details here, but that's sort of the general idea. Adjoint point AD, I don't need to bother about setting up and solving the response problem. And I basically solve one response problem per output parameter and I get all the sensitivities I want. Okay, now, how did we implement this? Um, I should say the current status is a work in progress. Um, right now we have, as I said, bachelor, one bachelor student, Niklas, who worked for 12 weeks, half time, 20 hours a week, and some follow up and support from us as DFTK developers. Forward mode is more or less fully supported. We have some polishing, which is needed. I'll show some code in a second. And nowadays we use this for stresses. So all our stresses are computed with forward mode AD. Adjoint mode is uh, sort of in work in progress, as I said. So we use a technique in Julia called Jane Rules JL. That's sort of like an abstraction framework on top of AD, meaning that we actually don't commit to one AD library. We can switch them at a later point. Um, we are at the moment still limited to reduced models. And the difficulties that we, that we are sort of struggling with are like C codes that we need to differentiate through uh, program flow, just general setup and program flow and like some mutation we still need. So that's work in progress, but I'll show some code and you can get an idea where we are. All right. Uh, yeah, that was the example from the beginning. Stresses nowadays, as I said, we implement them uh, using forward mode AD. So literally we are taking expression, this expression from the book and we're writing it down in code. And I mean, if you want to check, this is more or less the live code we're using. So this is really more or less what it looks like. Okay. Oops, I did not want to do that. I wanted to do something else. Where is my Zoom? And we are back. Okay. So I hope you can see all now the code. So um, what I wanted to briefly show you is basically what this really looks like in practice if you want to work with it. So polarizability is exactly the example I discussed and I want to compute it now with auto, um, automatic differentiation. So the way it works in DFTK is I'm, I have some setup function here which makes myself essentially the model. So I'm doing a standard DFT model, just LDA, nothing fancy. And I'm including this external field that we need for the response. Then I have a function to compute the dipole moment from the density, again, nothing really fancy. And I have basically a function to invoke the self-consistent field method and compute the dipole. Then I can just use like as a back, basically as a reference, I can use finite differences, just compute the dipole once at like a very small field strength and uh, compute it once without the field. And basically that needs two SCFs and I get some value. Now, how does it work with forward mode? That's the part where the user interaction is still a bit annoying because you sort of need to go through the details at the moment but essentially what happens here is exactly that you're doing the forward pass of the scf so you're basically doing the standard scf the primal pass and then you are you are sort of extracting the relevant information you're doing the promotion to dual numbers which i'm calling it here so basically this is exactly making sure that we can do the standard forward pass with uh, not just the number, but also the, 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 um, yeah, the gradient information. Uh, and down the line here, I'm solving the omega plus K, which is essentially the response problem. And I'm combining everything and coding it up. And then in practice, you, you can, for example, just invoke it with this compute dipole function again, and basically allows you to compute at the same time, not only the orbitals and the densities, but also the derivatives with respect to some external parameter. And yes, it works. So I can just like basically having set up all this scaffolding, which again, as I said, it's sort of not nice yet. We would like to improve this in the future. I can still just call derivative on this function. It does one SCF and then via forward diff, it allows me to compute 
at the given setting of ECAT and so on, and the given uh, forward diff, uh, finite differences parameters, I think this is a reasonable agreement. Now, of course, it's not just limited to, to properties like, like uh, polarizabilities. I can actually do the same thing with, an, with a functional. So I can, derivative, can take derivatives with respect to functional parameters. So the way I'm doing it here is I'm, again, I'm very, very simple. I'm just taking a LDA exchange and allow to scale, scalarly scale it up and down. It's just an example. So basically, this is an implementation of a custom exchange correlation functionals in DFT, uh, custom exchange correlation functional in DFTK. Then I'm again building my basis. In this case, I'm just using correlation from LDA and use my, my own exchange. Basically, the rest of the code is more or less the same. So I've hidden some of it in the boilerplate, but believe me, it's exactly the same annoying boilerplate code. And I can do the derivative basically of the dipole moment now with respect to the strength of the LDA exchange. And unsurprisingly, you find that if I make the exchange of LDA stronger, then the dipole moment goes down. I should say that I have taken a very simple system here. So this is neon, and then I've polarized the neon by adding an external field. So in case you wonder why neon all of a sudden has a dipole moment, that's the reason. Um, and just to show, we can do the same thing with reverse mode. In this case, the user interaction is already simple but we are sort of limited. So at the moment we can only do very simple uh, models where there's actually no nonlinear term inside, but this is just the restriction because we didn't get around to it. So we will work on this and it's definitely, the, the intention is to have this work for full DFT in the end. Um, yeah, so essentially same idea. I set up now a reduced model. I have dipole moment and in the end, in this case, it's much simpler. In this case, without any boilerplate, I just say, give me the gradient of the dipole. And again, I mean, I get it. You see, there are still some issues. We get complex numbers out, um, but yeah, I just wanted to show proof of principle. In principle, it works. All right. So back to my presentation. Um, and this is almost the end. Yes, so basically what, what, is, what is the conclusion here? Um, yeah, data enhanced methods, there is the need for unusual gradients. The exploration has just started, so we need flexible codes, in my opinion, to, to really uh, be able to, to make the exploration, get the exploration going. Uh, the size of parameter space, we need adjoint moid AD. And there's, yeah, there's some practical challenges, which is exactly the, why we are at the moment still restricted to, sing, to simple models. But, and the, yeah, the best framework, I think, is not so clear yet. Um, we have, as I've shown you, simple initial support for reverse mode. Forward mode is basically working with some boilerplate that we want to get rid of in the future. We have really profited a lot in, in this working from, our, from the Julia ecosystem. And idea I should really emphasize this is sort of a side effect. I mean, we have, to, we have to make it work and have to integrate it, but it's not the intention of DFTK. And yeah, I mean, if you have some ideas, if you have projects that you would like to do, we are not really ML people. So for us, like we're really happy for any input. If you have something which is which you would say, yeah, that's where we should maybe emphasize our developments and so on. And just again, a bit more advertisement. If you if that got you interested in either Julia or DFTK, there are some opportunities to to learn both. So I will I will be hosting a a one day, two session, uh, two half day session workshop on Julia, introductory Julia, where I'll go over some of the primitives, also algorithmic differentiation amongst others. So you can find out more and register here. And then together with Antoine Levitt and Eric Canthes, we will be organizing a school about DFTK and numerical methods for DFT for three days in, in Paris. So basically it will be centered around DFTK, our philosophy, and we will look into into electronic structure theory, mathematical background, numerical methods, and so on and so forth. And we will show applications and method development and simulations. So if you're interested, we would be very happy to welcome you there. And yeah, that leaves me to my acknowledgements. Uh, basically all the work, as I said, was done by Niklas and Antoine and myself uh, as main developers of DFTK. Really, we had supported him and yeah, thanks Antoine also for the continuous work on this great code. So yeah, that brings me to the end and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mikael. So session is open for, uh, for uh, questions. Right. 
can I start with, with this? Because um, I'm very curious about um, the Julie environment. Mm -hmm. We have very recently started. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, first of all, we'll be very interested in the school and stuff, both for me and for the students. Um, so first of all, I have a question about the, 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 the methods. So the, um, when you have to do this uh, uh, Starnheimer solver, mm -hmm. uh, if you can get back to it. Um, Sorry, yeah. yeah. I was a bit quicker on that. That's... Oops. Sorry. No. Usual problem of finding the slides here or the next one? Yeah, in the next one also. Okay, so um, I didn't quite get um, where is the the solver applied. So it is in order to find this inverse uh, chi chi zero, um, so that you no, solve. No, 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 no. No, yeah. So I no, not really. I mean, it's it's well. Okay, that, that's sort of the ideal way and the way we have implemented it right now. But I mean, it, it, ideally, you you only needed to to solve this linear problem here. Yeah, exactly. But so, do you need all? Do you need all of it? Do you need the full inverse matrix? No, 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 no. no. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, you never build the inverse matrix. This is an iterative solver. So. Yeah, you, you have this as like your system matrix and you, you, you actually use conjugate gradient to solve this. Yeah, yeah, and then you have some preconditioning techniques as well, yeah. So okay. no, you never, you never actually, you never actually solve the whole thing. Because it, it would be uh, not really linear, right? No, 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 <clears throat> no, no, indeed. Yeah, no, no, we, sorry, I should have been more clear on this. No, no we, we, this is an iterative procedure, yeah. Okay. Okay, then. and so I have also another point. Um, this is very quick, but at the beginning, you while, while mentioning um, the advantages of uh, the DFTK, you're talking about dumping, and I actually did what kind of dumping you were talking about? Uh, yeah, the, well, like basically in solid state DFT, if you if you're solving a an S, like if you're solving a standard problem, then typically you don't add the full update. To, to your density, for example. But instead, you, you usually, yeah, you, you scale the step, right? I mean, I don't know what. what ah, like, like in Broid and ca, ca, so in the sense that you mix them up to previous steps? Yes, but this is more like when you have a, when you have a fixed point problem, you're not, like your update is not just taking the output of the SCF step, but you're usually taking that and you're scaling it down. Right. So, for example, yeah. it's, I think the standard terminology is damping parameter okay. um, or mixing parameter. So, for example, yeah, mixing parameter, like one of the special calls the beta mix. I think that, that's yeah. that parameter. That's okay. what I mean. And I mean, yeah, it's one of these things that you have to choose. And typically what, what people do is you, you run it. If it doesn't work, you make it smaller. And in this paper, we find actually a case where making it smaller makes it worse. In some setting, like in the setting where you, for example, have a Anderson acceleration or dice type acceleration, and like we show that that this adaptive approach allows you to not worry about the stamping parameter, oh. and generally you don't get much worse results than, yeah, as if you would choose the best one. Yourself. Okay. To be to be fair, I I I have to admit that, for example, when I run a DFT codes, I also never care about that. I assume yes. that it's sort of a, yeah. in, but for, for taking care. Yeah, but for difficult systems, that's sort of not true. Okay. You, you typically need to think of these a bit. Okay, okay. Um, other questions? Yeah, Jonathan? Yeah, so first, I think it's um, great work. Well, I think it's definitely um, something that's still missing in the solid state community that, or that we don't have a differentiable code yet in reference to molecules. And so um, I'm just wondering, I mean, we, we already discussed a lot um, during the last days, but um, how's the performance right now for the differentiation yeah. versus the um, normal forward pass? It's, it's bad, is the, is the summary, because we have invested zero time looking at that. Yeah. So our main aim at the moment is to get it to work. And then we actually, 
like first step is get it to work. Second step is like clean up all the user interfaces and hide all the annoying details and sort of uh, yeah make the code in line with what the differentiation like what is easy for the differentiation. I mean, in that sense, we're not rewriting the code from scratch, but some modifications are, are obviously needed to avoid like mutation and all these aspects <laughs> I was talking about. And then the, the next aspect is then performance. So that's it's on the agenda, but at the moment, I would say a factor of 10, maybe <coughs> like I'm just guessing. I have yeah. really no, not looked at this. So this is basically a number I'm just coming up with in my mind. So yeah, at the moment it's bad. I mean, in the end, it's the uh, well, the performance of the differentiable code usually doesn't need to be as good as you only use it to train something, a functional or something, and then the large calculations you do anyway in the in, in a different code yeah. and that's performed. Yeah, I should I should emphasize that what I said with the fact of 10 is really specifically the AD pass. Yeah. So if we do a standard SCF calculations, we are more within a factor of two or four. Like it depends a bit on the setting uh, with respect to standard code. That's also because some symmetries we don't use yet like for example if you have a gamma point you have some extra symmetries we're not like yeah it's not everything not all the tricks are implemented at the moment. okay thank you okay so i i have uh, one last question that i'm pretty sure you 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 really like to answer to that <laughs> um and uh and it's related to this so in all our communities when we talk about um, uh, high performance code, we normally have Fortran or the C. This is for performance yeah. uh, reasons. And when it is rather like uh, we want something easy to, to read, to interface with a growing community, we refer to Python. So yeah. why Julian? <laughs> yeah, the answer is because you don't have two codes. I mean, the, the big problem is that if you are if you're if you're working in the traditional approach that your your readable code is in Python. And your fast code is in C or Fortran, then if you, for example, doing mathematical development, you have the challenge that often the parts you need to work with are the things where a lot of computation is done. So you're not really profiting from the Python approach. And that means that still people do MATLAB or other testing implementations for the algorithms. And that's like, for, for example, these adaptive and the, the, this LDOS algorithm, we basically profited a lot from the fact that you could do simple systems first, understand everything like 1D, really reduce, and then on the same code, without rewriting our, our code, our algorithm, we then applied it to these big systems like these ones here to really test it, to show that it's not just something that works on paper, but actually works in practice. And I mean, if I think about a Python C code, for example, that would mean I first write the algorithm in Python to be able to quickly play with it and see what actually are the building blocks I need. And to get it to work and then later in the second step i do i do put it into the c part to make it fast and yeah i think that that barrier just makes it harder and in in julia you have a continuous optimization like even if there's one part of your code where it's slow sure you have to invest time to make it fast but it's something where you can iteratively make it faster by modifying it locally exactly where it is and sort of the, the code is only bad to read well, well not as nice to read i should better say um, in the regions where it really matters, and it's a gradual process. It's not a Python or C. It's it's gradual. That's I think the biggest advantage is here. Okay, I will certainly have more discussion with you about that. But first, we have uh, Matthias, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would like to comment on this and uh, ask a question. Um, sorry, just here. Okay, no, see. So the comment would be. Um, I, I, I'm not really buying that argument that you just gave because mm -hmm. the standard way to to combine Python as a glue and efficient code and Fortran or C is well you have the libraries right like NumPy for example is a this is a good example for, for widely used library right but um but what re, as we are also dabbling a bit with the autodiff and and what really brought me off was that um you have some, as I mean you have some performance it we use Google Jacks I would say I, I cannot give a better number than you but maybe factor three only even so not so much actually mm -hmm. right but but you don't you don't have to do the derivative by hand every time you change the model right that's huge i think and 
the, 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 in the one example from a student, it was like 300 lines of code versus like three or something like that. I mean, maybe I exaggerated, but it was a lot less code than, than, than you have with the, when you hand code some derivatives, right? And that, that I found impressive and, and very useful. You mean now with respect to Jax or? No, I mean with respect to auto differentiation because. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, right? that, but that is, that's more or less exactly my point, right? That, that, <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I'm sort of agreeing with you here that auto differentiation is exactly what allows you to, to do this in less code, right? Yeah. And that's why I, I would advocate it. Yeah, yeah, okay, then we agree. Then I misunderstood. Um, uh, the question that I have is because I, I look a bit at Julia from outside and it certainly looks interesting. But how about maturity with respect to the packages, right? One reason why Python is successful is because you have so many packages, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, how, how's the yeah. status? It's it's getting better every day, is the honest answer. So I mean I've been using it for three years and, and it's just impressive how much the ecosystem has expanded. So with respect to to packages, um I mean, the, the, the number of natural, like just pure Julia packages inc is increasing quite rapidly. But the point is that you don't need to give up your Python packages because yeah. all of them are basically accessible by, by a simple interface in both directions. So it's is not that, that you are giving up Python by going. Yeah, to I saw that. Is that working well in practice? At that um, it's working reasonably well. So of course there's edge cases and problems, but for example, I mean, even big libraries like PySCF or TensorFlow, you can use them from Julia. And I okay. mean, and so PySCF are used regularly from Julia and it's no problem. Uh, thank you, thanks. Yeah, so, so in that sense, and the natural packages, like especially in the ML regime and, and like, for example, looking at partial derivative, partial PDEs and that sort of stuff, it's quite impressive what ecosystem has evolved over the past few years. I would say it's probably even better than in Python in that particular regime, right? Yeah. It's not ML, that's of course a lot in Python, but yeah. So it definitely has its niche where it's already getting better than alternatives. In, yeah, but I have to say in, in like material science and chemistry is sort of just starting to evolve at the moment, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we are perfectly on time and uh, I don't see further questions so I would uh, like to thank Mikael and all the speakers of the of today thank you very much and um, well and then uh, we we can have a, a pause now and we resume at uh, at two this afternoon so don't miss it goodbye <laughs>